All right, today's lecture we're going to be covering chapter 21, toxicology. Um, toxicology, we're going to be discussing um, recognition, management of uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, nerve agents, um, how and when to contact poison, uh, poison control center. Um, we're going to be discussing different uh, poison ingestions, inhaled, ingested, injected, absorbed. Um, we'll talk about al alcohol and drug intoxication um, and withdrawal from those. So every day we come into contact with um, potentially poisonous things. And these can be things from natural, um, like plants, um, toxins from plants and, and other natural things. Um, it can be chemicals, it can be um, laundry detergents. Um, if you work in any sort of industry or you encounter anybody in, in, in an industry that uses chemicals, harsh chemicals, fertilizers, those kind of things, um, all potentially poisonous things. Um, acute poisoning um, affects 2 million people each year. And, and uh, however, chronic poisoning is more common. So acute poisoning being somebody ingest um, a toxic level of a, of a chemical or a substance that, that poisons them. Um, chronic poisoning being something where you're exposed um, to that poison over a, a long period of time. Um, you know, overall deaths caused by poisoning are fairly rare. Um, we don't encounter, um, you know, especially, especially deaths from, from poisonings, um, all that often. Um, and a lot of that is due to, um, the, uh, uh child, the regulations that have been put on, uh, many industries, um, especially with, uh, child, um, uh, resistance things. So child resistant caps, you know. Um, Tide Pods was a big thing um, not too long ago. And if you notice, if you pay attention to the packaging for those kind of things, um, there are safety features built into those so that kids can't access them. Uh, Tide Pods, I know, was a huge, huge issue. Um, it, originally, they just had them essentially in plastic bags that you just opened up. And now the, the plastic bag has to have some sort of um, Ziploc or zipper type, type uh, mechanism at the top that um, requires you to actually perform multiple steps to open it rather than just being able to open it by by uh, squeezing it open. Um, deaths caused by chronic poisoning in adults have been rising as a result of drug abuse. So one of the things we're going to talk about today is is uh, drug abuse in regards to it being a poison emergency. So we've we have talked about drug abuse before and we've talked about some of those um, medical emergencies like opioid, um, heroin, those kind of things. Today we're going to look at them um, in more in the in the uh, from the view of a of a poisoning because it really is it's it's a toxic chemical it's a poison that that these folks are putting into their bodies. So definition here: toxicology is the study of toxic or poisonous substances. Um, so some more definitions: a poison, any substance whose chemical action can uh, damage body structures or impair body uh, body function. So that's a pretty broad uh, excuse me pretty broad definition. Um, any, any substance whose chemical action can damage body structures. Um, so again, very broad definition there. Toxin, uh, poisonous substance produced by a bacteria, animal, or plant. So these are more natural things. So poisons can be almost any substance. Um, toxins are particularly related to natural substances, bacteria, animals, and plants. Substance abuse is the misuse of any substance um, to produce some desired effect, and that effect might not necessarily be a good effect, right? If this is an illegal uh, substance or um, some sort of narcotic, that's uh, the desired effect m might not be a, a good thing. Um, overdose um, is described as a, a toxic dose of a drug. So <laughs> remember, you can overdose on anything, and these overdoses on any medication, um, I should say, and these overdoses are not always uh, intentional. So someone can accidentally overdose on a certain medication. So one of the more common overdoses that we actually see, believe it or not, is, is um, older folks that, that uh, have taken their medication in the morning and then later on, um, later on that day they, uh, they realize that, um, that they, uh, they actually take it again, not realizing that they, that they took that, uh, that medication already in the morning. So that's overdoses don't always have to be, uh, you know, the, the drug abuser uh, in the alleyway uh, shooting up heroin. It can be as simple as uh, uh, somebody just forgetting that they've taken their medication. They take uh, accidentally take a, another dose 
and now they've now they've potentially overdosed on that drug, depending on the drug that it is. Your your primary oops, excuse me. Give me one second here. Um, your primary uh, responsibility um, to the patient. Oh, I apologize. Your primary responsibility to the patient uh, is to recognize that a poisoning has occurred. Um, pay attention to your surroundings. Um, you could also be exposed to that same substance. So we're going to talk about this a little more in depth when we talk about scene safety. But like with anything else, your safety is paramount. Your safety has to be um, uh, number one in these events. Um, please pay attention to those surroundings. We're going to talk about um, uh, different uh, suicide attempts that people have made in the past that have exposed first responders to um, toxic substances, uh, poisonous substances. So pay attention to your surroundings. Um, if you if you rush into that scene and you become exposed by that same substance, it's, it's not helping anything. Um, very small, depending on the type of poison or toxin, very small amounts uh, can cause considerable damage or death. Um, if you uh, suspect exposure to a toxic substance, you need to notify medical control and begin um, emergency treatment, especially if it's to yourself. So if you experience some sort of toxic substance exposure, um, ensuring that, yes, we have a patient to take care of, but you have to be priority number one for yourself. So you need to make sure to, to obtain that med medical treatment for yourself, emergency medical treatment for yourself. Um, signs and symptoms of poisoning vary according to the specific agent. So depending on what um, what poison, what substance you are, um, you've or this person has come in contact to, or you have come in contact to, signs and symptoms can vary uh, widely. And we'll talk about um, the most common throughout the, the the class today. We'll talk about the most common poisonings, the most common toxic substances that people are going to uh, come in contact with, and we'll discuss each sign and symptom. So here's just some common, and, and I'm not going to read through all of these, but this is just some common uh, uh, overdose uh, agents, some common signs and symptoms of those uh, overdose uh, medications or drugs. Um, so I'll let you just look over this. You can certainly pause the, the video. Um, we're going to talk about each of these different things in depth as we go throughout the PowerPoint today. Um, but if you'd like to pause the video and, and review these, feel free to do so now. All right, um, so identifying the patient and the poison. So one of the more important things that we want to think about when we have a patient who uh, we suspect has, has overdosed, who we suspect has come in contact with a poison or a toxin, we need to ask the right questions. So we need to ask, um, what substance did you take? When did you take it last? How much did you take? Did you have anything to eat or drink before you took it? Did you have anything to eat or drink after you took it? Um, has anyone given you an antidote or a substance orally since you ingested it? And then how much do you weigh? And all of this is important information that not only the receiving hospital, the receiving physician is going to want to know, but if you do elect to call poison control, which we'll talk about in a little bit, um, they, these are all questions that poison control needs to know the answers to, um, to, to know how to proceed. Um, so, you know, for example, if, if I... Um, accidentally splashed a drop of, of uh, dish soap uh, into my mouth, um, being that, you know, I'm of significant size, I have only ingested a very small amount of the substance, I drank uh, or, you know, uh, flushed my mouth with water afterwards, you know, those kind of answers to that question, to these questions is going to tell us that, all right, this is a, a minimal exposure at best, and poison control is probably going to advise, advise just to to monitor symptoms and, and let the person, you know, continue on with their day um, versus um, an infant. Uh, so let's say a 10 pound patient um, who got into Tide Pods and ate the entire Tide Pod, right? So that's going to be a, a situation where the exposure is a lot more significant and that, that patient's going to need to be transported to the hospital uh, immediately. Um, so you can see the difference there. Um, so answers to these questions are incredibly important, um, not only for the receiving facility, but poison control as well. Um, one of the questions that we don't see up here, something that we wouldn't want to ask this person is, um, why did you take it? So 
Um, that's that's not a question we always want to ask, right? So the, there's there's many reasons why something might have happened. If it was accidental, it was accidental. That's okay. Um, but you don't want to ever assume or imply that this person was um, was was trying to harm themselves. Um, you know, certainly let them tell you that if that's the case. Um, but at this point in, in this in the game, the very beginning, it doesn't really matter why they took it. Now later on, as time goes on with our assessment, we get closer to the hospital. Yeah, it, it may be appropriate to to discuss maybe whether or not this patient was was suicidal or whether there's some other reason why it happened. Um, certainly uh, things like child abuse, things like that, certainly we want to get the answers to those questions. But originally, in the in the very beginning of your assessment, these are the questions that we need to ask. We don't need to know why it happened. For now, we just need to know the answers to these questions. Um, try to determine the nature of the, of the poison. Um, so look around for some immediate uh, clues. So if you don't have a lot of information, you know, uh, look around for some clues. So a very common call that we get is, is the kids got into the, the medicine cabinet or the kids got into uh, the cleaning supplies and we don't know what they ingested. So we get this call quite often. This happens quite quite a bit. Um, you show up and they say, you know, um, they got into the, 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 the cleaning supplies and we don't know what they what they ate and we don't know if they even ate anything at all. So at that time, it's, it's a good idea to look around um, and start looking for clues. Is there any substances on or around their mouth or their hands? If there's anything on their mouth or their hands, try to identify what substance that was based on the color, the consistency, those kind of things. If they don't have anything on them, what materials are around them that don't currently have caps on them, right? So if a, if a child takes a cap off of something, um, chances are they're not probably going to put that cap back on, so we can assume that maybe they ingested some of that particular uh, poison or substance. So the point here is uh, look around and look for clues, try to figure out um, what may have happened in, in whatever case this may be. And then whatever substance that you assume this person has ingested or if, or if you know what substance they've ingested, um, it's always a good idea to um, bring some of that material with you to the hospital. Certainly in, a, in an airtight, a sealed container, um, please bring that stuff with you so that um, those containers can, and, and substances can provide some more additional information to the physicians at the hospital. If the patient vomits, uh, feel free to examine the contents for pill fragments. Um, if someone has intentionally or unintentionally overdosed on uh, medication and they have vomited very quickly after doing so, uh, we can count, count pill fragments and see if we can try to identify how much actually got into their system. Certainly wear your personal protective equipment and then, uh, as always, we're going to document anything that we see. All right, so we're going to talk about different ways that poisons enter the body. Um, <clears throat> So emergency care for a patient, there's a wide range of things that we may be doing for this patient. We may just be reassuring them, getting them to the hospital. We may have to perform CPR on them. So uh, there's, there's a, a wide range of things that we may be doing. Most of the time, though, most of the time, you won't be administering any sort of antidote. Um, definitive treatment typically for a lot of these things can only be provided at the emergency department. So we're going to transport them as quickly as possible. Um, and then the most in, important treatment that you can perform, and as we talk about how poisons enter the body, the most important thing that you can do is to remove that poison from the body as quickly as possible. So dilute it, remove it. If it's a substance that's on their skin, if it's a powdery substance, we brush the area off first. If it's a, a wet substance, a, a, a fluid substance, we're going to flush that area as much as possible. Uh, copious amounts of water. All right, so what treatment you're going to provide depends upon the poison that, um, how the poison got in, into the patient's body. So there's four routes to consider here, inhalation, absorption, ingestion, and injection. All right, so top left here, inhalation. So if you look at the picture there, he's breathing in something, inhalation. Um, if you look at the uh, top right, uh, top right is absorption. So the, the skin is absorbing that chemical through the skin, or the body's absorbing that through the skin. Bottom left there, the pills, that would be ingestion. So they're actually eating or swallowing something, getting it, it's going through their stomach um, or through their mouth. 
And then the bottom right there, you see injection. Um, so that would be any time someone uses a needle uh, and a syringe to inject some sort of, of poison into their system. Um, all four of those routes can lead to uh, serious and, and life-threatening life conditions. So just because um, it was uh, absorption and, and there was a, only a little bit of powder of some sort of chemical on their skin doesn't mean that that's not life-threatening. completely depends on the chemical, completely depends on how long it was on their skin. So any of those routes can be um, possibly life-threatening. If you're uns uh, uncertain on how to treat a patient, um, find that container and call poison control. We're going to talk about poison control here in a little bit. All right, so we're going to go through each of these different methods uh, of, of um, uh, different ways that, that these chemicals, poisons, uh, toxins can be, be uh, inserted into the body. So we're going to go through inhaled poisons first. Um, first thing to think about with an inhaled poison is move the patient to fresh air immediately. So if the patient is inhaling some sort of chemical and you're in a, a manufacturing facility and this chemical is causing them problems, the first thing to think about is get out of that environment. So move that patient to fresh air. The patient may require some supplemental oxygen, so use that at your discretion based on the patient's respiratory status. Um, if you Again, if you suspect the presence of a toxic gas, uh, always call for a hazmat team. So if there's any suspected uh, uh, dangerous chemicals or toxins, you see a, a, a cloud of, of, uh, of gas or something, um, you're going to activate a hazmat team immediately. Um, using a self-contained breathing apparatus, so those of you who, that have been through um, fire school, if you end up, um, if you end up, or if you're going to go through fire school, if you end up uh, working for a fire and EMS department, and it, and you have to uh, rescue someone um, out of a toxic environment, um, you're going to want to wear your self-contained breathing apparatus to protect yourself before going in and and rescuing that person. Um, some patients need decon uh, decontamination by the hazmat team um, after getting them out of that toxic environment. So we may not be able to help them right away. It may be a, a case where in order to protect ourselves, we've got to allow that person to be decontaminated. Um, and that could be as simple as being, uh, you know, sprayed down with, with a hose, you know, copious amounts of water to get them decontaminated so that we can help them. All patients who have inhaled poison require immediate transport. Uh, because of the seriousness of the potential harm to their lungs and their respiratory system, um, we need to get that person to the hospital immediately, especially at the EMT level, because we don't have the option um, uh, to, to uh, int endotracheally um, intubate this person. So if this person needs intubated, they need to get to the hospital. So be prepared to use some supplemental oxygen. You may end up using a bag valve mask and you may need a suction, uh, but remember that transporting this person to the hospital is going to be the best thing for them um, if they've breathed in, if they've inhaled some sort of poison. Um, some people use inhaled poisons to commit suicide in vehicles. Um, we'll talk about this. Uh, I think I might have a picture up here uh, in the next slide. Um, some patients uh, will turn their car on in their garage, so they allow those exhaust fumes to uh, you know, create high levels of carbon monoxide in the garage. So if you were to open a door, um, if you get a call for a welfare check and you were to open a door on a garage and notice that the car is running or it appears the car has been running, there's an, there may be an, an exhaust odor uh, and the person's unconscious or unresponsive in the car, just remember you've got to back out of that situation until uh, pro proper uh, respiratory support can be provided to you or until we can ventilate that garage. So think about those kind of things. Chemicals or detergents in tightly sealed containers uh, create a gas chamber. When you open the door, so there's there's a, a way that uh, folks kill themselves by mixing chemicals in their car. Uh, they, they mix uh, hydrogen sulfide, and that hydrogen sulfide uh, creates a deathly chemical. If you were to open the door of that vehicle, uh, you would instantly be overcome by that by that uh, by that fume. So it's important to be aware of those kind of things so you can look for some signs. If you notice a, a powdery substance, a gas, a, a cloud in the car uh, where somebody's you know unconscious, unresponsive, just be aware of the fact that this may be a suicide type situation. 
I do have a picture of something like that coming up here in the slideshow. <clears throat> so absorbed and surface contact uh, poison. So these can affect the patient in many ways. So they can, can affect the patient directly through the skin, like a transdermal uh, medication patch does. It just soaks in through the skin, through mucous membranes or through the eyes. Uh, could also affect them through chemical burns, rashes, lesions, um, and can, can cause systemic effects. So just because it's a, an exterior type of, of absorption where it's just contacting the exterior of their body uh, doesn't mean that it can't uh, cause systemic effects. There's some signs and symptoms of absorbed or, or surface contact poisons. They've got obviously a history of the exposure. So they've got a story where, hey, I got this chemical. It, it ended up on my skin. My skin started burning and I got the stuff off. So we have a history of that exposure. Um, liquid or powder on a patient's skin, like I mentioned before, if it's a powder, you want to brush it off. We do, we do not flush powder off of skin. If you add water to some of these powdered chemicals, it can actually cause a chemical reaction and make the problem a lot worse. So if it's a powder, we want to brush the powder off first. If it's a liquid, we can flush the liquid off with copious amounts of water. So they may have burns, they may have itching, irritation, redness of the skin, swelling. You may have some odor as well. So again, avoid contaminating yourself or others. Remove that substance as rapidly as possible. Also remove all contaminated clothing. Um, anything that's of powder or, or liquid uh, substance, you, you want to get their clothing off as well because that clothing may have trace amounts of that chemical in it. So get them completely stripped down. Once you get into the back of the medic, you're going to completely expose them, um, put on uh, you know, a gown or a, a blanket or something over top of them, but get all of their clothes off of them. Um, and obviously flush and wash the skin like I mentioned before. So as I mentioned, the dry powder, uh, brush it off first, um, and then you can flood that area with water. And, and this is, I say copious amounts of, of fluid or copious amounts of water. We're talking 15 to 20 minutes straight of, of water. So a lot of, a lot of water, uh, you, you really can't do too much. You're going to be flushing this all the way to the hospital. If the liquid's been spilled onto the skin, you're going to uh, just go straight to flushing it out for about 15 to 20 minutes. For chemical agents introduced into the eyes, we want to do the same thing is uh, irrigate the eyes as quickly as possible. What you see here, this is kind of a neat little trick if you look real closely, this is a nasal cannula. So if you uh, were to take the end of a nasal cannula and you plug that into uh, an IV bag, a, sa a saline solution or um, some other water source, you can flow water through the nasal cannula and it actually constantly flushes water in the eyes. So it just drops water into the corner of the eyes and just continually flushes the water out. So again, that's a really neat idea, um, and, and I have used that in the past. It works really well. Um, that just allows you to continually flush those eyes for, again, 15 to 20 minutes, basically all the way to the hospital. Many chemical burns occur in industrial setting. I've talked a little bit about that. So, uh, a lot of times there's eye wash stations or safety showers. If there is eye wash stations or safety, sho safety showers, um, don't hesitate to let that person stay in those showers. Let, you know, that's working. That's helping them. Um, so you use those resources that you have them. You should always have a hazmat team available if it's an industrial type chemical. Um, ensure, always ensure that you and the patient are, are thoroughly de decontaminated. Obtain there at the bottom, you see obtain material safety data sheets. They call these MSDS sheets. Any industrial facility that has chemicals, any sort of chemical, is required to um, uh, have on site uh, MSDS sheets, material safety data sheets. Uh, so uh, having someone locate those quickly and taking those to the hospital with you is important. That way, there's some guidance on how to treat this person. That's usually what's located or what's what's the content of those MSDS uh, forms is it tells you about the chemicals. It tells you how to treat in case someone had an exposure to those chemicals. So obtain those those sheets, those forms and and transport those with the patient to the hospital. So ingested poisons through the mouth, about 80 percent. So vast majority of poisonings happen by mouth. Uh, ingesting things. Liquid, as I mentioned before, household cleaners, kids getting into the household cleaners, those kind of things. Contaminated food, um, another thing that we're going to talk about today as, as a, uh, a toxin is, is like food poisoning. 
Um, so remember, you know, that's a that's a, a, a toxic event, um, even though it's not as maybe doesn't appear as serious as some of these other things we're talking about. It's certainly something that that uh, you're going to get called out on um, plants and then drugs. So uh, a vast majority of poisoning is happening by mouth. With, with children, typically it's accidental. Um, with adults, it's more deliberate. And that's where we're talking about the suicides, uh, suicide attempts by by taking a, a, a full bottle of pills, something like that. Signs and symptoms vary with any of these by the type of poison, poison the age of the patient, um, time that has gone on since the ingestion. If someone uh, swallows an entire bottle of pills, uh, you know, there's, there's 15, 20 minutes there that, that we can get that person to the hospital. They can pump that stomach and they'll have very little signs or symptoms from that. Whereas if they took the bottle of pills this morning and they're calling you at uh, 4 p.m., you know, that's that's all been ingested and, and absorbed into their body. So we're kind of past that point at that at that moment. Uh, treat any signs or symptoms that you have. Notify the poison control center and medical control of the patient's condition. Um, consider whether there is unabsorbed poison remaining in the GI tract and whether you can safely and effectively prevent that absorption. We're going to talk today a little bit about uh, activated charcoal. However, we don't use that. Uh, much you don't see that used in central Ohio at all uh, but we will talk about activated charcoal today as, as a method to prevent that absorption of poisons so this is a, what a bottle of a activated charcoal looks like it's just an example of a bottle of activated charcoal um, it is a suspension typically it's an activated charcoal suspension so it's in some sort of fluid um, some EMS systems allow EM EMTs to use this it is in your scope of practice however uh, this is not used very often, I'll be honest with you. Um, always assess the ABCs with any patient who has been, been poisoned. With, with, as with anything else, we're going to always assess those ABCs. So injected poisons, um, exposure by injection, um, but for the most part, we're talking about intravenous drug abuse here. But also the, the environmental issues, envenomation by insects, arachnids, reptiles. So we talked about that a little bit already uh, about, uh, you know, bee stings, those kind of things. It's, that's, that's a poison uh, by injection. So, so still kind of talking about the same stuff there. Usually absorb quickly into the body and cause intense local tissue destruction. So if someone, uh, if someone injects some sort of poison or, or drug into their system, it's absorbed very quickly. And a lot of times you see a lot of death of, of tissue, destruction of tissue around that site. So IV drug abusers, chronic drug abusers, you'll see they've got a lot of sores, a lot of uh, wounds, or, you know, all around their body because of this tissue destruction. We can't dilute that or remove it from the body in the field. So this person needs transported to the hospital. There's very few cases where we actually have medications we can provide them, uh, opiates being one of those. But for the most part, we can't do anything about it. Uh, we've got to just transport them to the hospital whole different, uh, you know, uh, or excuse me, a whole wide range of, of signs and symptoms for injected poisons. Weakness, dizziness, fever, chills, unresponsiveness. Uh, we'll talk about opioids being one of the most common, you know, signs and symptoms there is unresponsiveness. Um, but on the flip side, they may be excited. Uh, it might, may have a high, you know, excitability level. So they may have injected a, a drug that's caused them to, um, you know, be more excited and, and worked up. As always, monitor the airway, provide oxygen, um, you know, nausea, vomiting. Um, if you have any swelling, and this really goes more towards the bee stings, uh, we talked already about um, uh, about the, the body's immune immuno response. Uh, that was in the last chapter. Um, remove. We talked about this there as well. Remove rings, watches, bracelets. If there's any swelling around that injection site. You need to remove all of those, uh, all of that jewelry. All right, so we'll uh, quickly just go through our assessment of a patient who has in injected, absorbed, uh, ingested, or inhaled some sort of, of poison or toxin. Um, the first, uh, the first thing we're going to want to look at is our our dispatch call. So a well trained dispatcher can obtain information on a poisoning call, and hopefully they have obtained that kind of information. What you don't want to see, and, and you should be asking questions if you do see this, is if you get dispatched for a run, a poisoning run, and they don't have any information for you. 
you know, you need to be asking those questions. Hey, what are we, what exactly are we going in on? Can you get us some more information before we get there? Because I need to have the proper personal protective equipment on to help this person. So get some information as, get as much information as possible. Always take standard precautions. Always have uh, your proper PPE on. As you're doing the scene size up, like we talked about before, think about what could harm you. Do you smell some sort of odor? Is the scene really safe? Are there medication bottles lying around? Do you see alcoholic beverages lying around? Are there syringes or other drug paraphernalia? Uh, and again, any odors uh, indicating a presence of a drug laboratory. If you ever think in any case that this is an unsafe scene for you, you need to back away and, and call for additional help. All right, so your primary assessment, uh, we're obviously obtaining that general impression. Level of consciousness, any life threats, uh, airway, breathing, circulation, as always. Um, with airway and breathing, uh, we obviously need to ensure that that patient has an open airway and adequate ventilation. If not, we need to start bagging them. Uh, so on our opioid overdoses, uh, that patient is going to be very depressed respiratory. We're going to have uh, very slow respirations. We need to be aggressive. Start bagging them with a BVM. Have suction available. Um, patients that have been poisoned are always susceptible to vomiting. And then with circulation, as, as we normally would, assess the pulse and, and skin condition. As far as your transport decision goes, for most of these uh, poisonous uh, emergencies, poison emergencies, toxic emergencies, um, we're, we're going to need to transport to the hospital. So our transport decision is usually going to be make this a priority patient. And, and, and get going to the hospital, unless this is a very a minor incident and we've, we've talked to poison control uh, and, and they're advising us to, to the person can stay home. All right, so going into history taking, talking about their chief complaint, um, certainly ask them what's bothering them at this point, get a good sample history. If your patient's unresponsive, get some history from people around. We've already talked a lot about, about uh, excuse me, we've already talked a lot about this, um, but especially in a poison emergency or an emergency in some industrial area where there's been contact with a chemical, you're going to have to get a lot of information from people around, uh, bystanders, co-workers, friends or family members, if that person's unresponsive. So what, what substances involve some good questions to ask regarding that sample history? What substances involved? Uh, when did the patient become exposed to it? How much did they ingest? All of these are great questions. You may or may not get answers to them, but if we can, that's what we want to know. Um, over what period did they take the substance? Um, have, has anybody performed any intervention? Uh, with When we talk about opioids, uh, most people in, in, uh, in the country even now have access to, to Narcan or Naloxone. So asking around, hey, did anyone give them Narcan? Has anybody administered any other medications? It's important to know that and, and pass that information along. And then again, patient weight. Patient weight's important just based on, or just because of the numbers. Uh, poison Control Center is going to do some calculations to determine based on the amount of drug, medication, toxin, poison, whatever it was, uh, is it that, how, how bad is that going to affect them due to their weight, based on their weight? As far as the secondary assessment goes for these patients, certainly focus on the area of the body involved so and, and the route of the exposure. So if it's a chemical burn on the arm, we're obviously going to focus on assessing that arm and the burn. If it's something that they've ingested, we're obviously going to be focusing on their abdomen. Um, you know, if there's any pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, those kind of things. So, so focus in on the particular area of the exposure. If it was an inhalation exposure, focusing on their respiratory system would be appropriate at that point. Um, obviously, with, with any patient, complete list set of uh, baseline vital signs is important. So please don't hesitate to get the baseline vitals. And then as far as our reassessment goes, uh, we want to continually reassess their ABCs. We want to repeat those vital signs in, as always, 15 minutes for a stable patient, five minutes um, for uh, somebody who is uh, unstable, um, or, or even, even more often uh, for a patient who's consumed a harmful or lethal dose of something. We want to keep a very close eye on those, those patients. All right, so we'll talk about treatment a little bit. Uh, with anything, supporting the ABCs is the most important task. Keeping that person breathing and keeping their pulse rate, uh, keeping their heart beating is the most important. 
concern for us. Um, contact medical control or the poison center. So poison control, uh, if you're calling in the central Ohio area, I've got the number on uh, the PowerPoint here. It's uh, 800-222-1222. That's uh, an important number as an EMT, as, a, as an EMS professional now. Put that number in your phone and uh, put it down under poison control. So that if you do encounter any of these, you've got that number ready to go. You can call Poison Control. Poison Control is actually operated out of an office at Nationwide Children's Hospital, and that covers um, a, a, a large area. I believe it's I believe it's the Midwest, may even be more of the country. All calls into that Poison Control Center right here in Columbus at Nationwide Children's. Um, so it's an important uh, number to, to have in your phone and don't hesitate to use them. I've used them multiple times in the past and they're incredibly easy to work with. You call in, they answer the phone within a few seconds. They're gonna ask you a ton of questions that are really good questions, a lot of the stuff we've already talked about. They're gonna ask you um, you know, some information about the patient, what they took, all of those types of things. And then they're gonna tell you their recommendation. These are the experts, these are folks who have a ton of information at their hands so they have a, a database with every possible chemical or toxin available um, and they're going to search that database and they're going to make their best recommendation i would follow or heed those recommendations so whatever they're telling you to do it's a good idea follow that recommendation if they say that patient needs transported i would transport them um, so um, call them don't hesitate to call them they also ask for a follow-up number so Generally, if the patient, if you're going to leave the patient at home, you want to give them their their phone number. If you're taking this patient to the hospital, it's okay to give them your phone number. But poison control will usually call back in about a half an hour to an hour just to see how everything's going. So kind of a, a neat service. It's completely free. Uh, you can call. You don't have to be an EMT to call. Anybody can call uh, and get and get uh, recommendations. As far as communication and documentation, report as much information as you have about that poison uh, or chemical to the hospital. Um, and as I mentioned before, if you've got those material safety data sheets, uh, those MSDS sheets, uh, please get those, bring those with you and, and uh, pass those along to the, to the physician in the emergency room. All right, so what are, the, what are some more uh, emergency medical care items that we can think about or, or perform for this person? Um, ensure scene safety. I, I really can't stress that enough um, with this presentation. And scene, scene safety is incredibly important. Remove any tablets or fragments from the patient's mouth. So if they've ingested pills or something or they've swallowed medications, if there's anything left in their mouth, try to get that out. Uh, we can't do much about what they've already swallowed, but try to get that out, uh, get, the, get anything out of their mouth if it's still in there. Wash or brush any poison uh, from the patient's skin. We already talked about that. Maintain ABCs, provide oxygen when necessary, uh, treat for shock should you see the patient in shock. Um, and then we talked about activated charcoal. Activated charcoal, you would have that patient uh, drink that suspension, that solution. Um, and the intent there is that the activated charcoal kind of buffers the uh, chemicals um, and, and, and stops the absorption of those chemicals into the body's um, system. Not something that is used very frequently. Uh, we don't, Columbus Fire Department, we don't carry it. A lot of places in central Ohio that I know of and really around Ohio, for that matter, uh, don't even carry activated charcoal. So the, the, the really, the, the most important thing you're going to do for this person is recognition, uh, recognizing that they've ingested or absorbed um, or inhaled some sort of poison or chemical, and then getting them to the hospital as quickly as possible. So there's one of the, I think one of the one of the reasons that activated charcoal is not used so much is because there's a lot of patients where it's not indicated for. So if you see here, um, anybody with alcohol, excuse me, alkali poisons, cyanide, ethanol, iron, lithium, methanol, mineral acids, should not take activated charcoal. Well, the problem is is that there's just so many chemicals. I'm certainly not a chemist. Um, so it's hard to know exactly if that patient's taken any of these things or if any of these things are, are elements of the, the chemical or poison that they've ingested. So it's just, it becomes a little bit too difficult to differentiate. I think that's why it's not used as much. And so there's some more information about that activated charcoal. 
um, typically 50 grams, uh, and it's usually given at one gram per kilogram of body weight. So one gram per kilogram. Uh, Insta char, actidose, liquid char, those are some different, different names of activated charcoal. It is a medication, uh, considered a medication, so you need to obtain approval for medical control. Um, you shake the bottle up and you have the patient drink it. If they're refusing to drink it, which uh, um, I believe most uh, patients don't want to drink it, I don't think it's a very pleasant experience, um, you can certainly try to convince them, but you can't force them, so uh, just transport if they're going to refuse. Generally uh, end up with constipation, black stools, but uh, really not, not too bad a side effect. All right, so we're going to go through some different um, specific poisons, um, and we're going to talk, uh, starting off here, we're going to talk about some drug uh, drug misuses and substances. So over time, a person who routinely misuses, excuse me, misuses a substance uh, may need increasing amounts for it to achieve the same result. So it's called developing a tolerance. So a patient who um, takes pain medications over time they're going to need more pain medication to get the same reaction from it. So if it's controlling their pain now, two years from now it might not be controlling their pain and they need a higher dose. Um, so that's a possibility and, and that becomes a, um, a sticky situation to be in because sometimes their physician's not going to tell them uh, that, that they're going to, or their physician's not going to give them more medication, I should say. Um, or prescribe them more medication. So then that person begins to abuse it, and that's where we run into the possibility of overdosing. Um, as always, uh, safety is important. Uh, drug abusers have high incidence of, of infections, HIV, hepatitis. If you get uh, stuck by, uh, an inf uh, by a needle, assume that that needle was infected and report that to your supervisor immediately so that you can be tested and given prophylactic medications. It's incredibly important to report any needle stick um, or, or uh, possible exposure to HIV, hepatitis, any of these infections. Um, alcohol, so talking about some specific uh, different poisons here, um, we have to consider alcohol a, a possible poison. It, you know, taken in reasonable amounts, alcohol is is fairly safe. Um, but when it's excessively used, it, it becomes a poisonous substance for us. So one in 10 deaths among working age adults can be attributed to excessive alcohol use. That's pretty, that's a pretty uh, big number. You think 10% of the deaths among working age adults is, is related to alcohol or excessive alcohol use. Um, that's a pretty big number. And I will say when you get out there, uh, in the real world, on the street, you're going to notice that uh, you run into a lot of folks who have problems with alcohol. Damages the liver um, through chronic overuse and in uh, chronic overuse and or occasional heavy use, so binge drinking. Um, binge drinking can be um, almost more damage, damaging than chronic use, depending on the frequency, how often they binge, those kind of things. So alcohol is a CNS depressant, central nervous system depressant. Uh, so it decreases activity, it induces sleep, it, it dulls their sense of awareness, they get, um, you know, tired, weak. Every, I mean, you guys know what alcohol does to you, I'm sure. Um, if anybody's had too much to drink, you notice all of these symptoms. Um, it may cause aggressiveness, inappropriate behavior, um, increases the effects of other drugs. So if you've taken uh, some sort of medication and then drink alcohol on top of that, it may increase the effect of those drugs. Uh, which may be a bad thing. So if your patient's exhibiting signs of serious uh, central nervous system depression, we may have to provide respiratory support. So somebody who's in what we may call alcohol poisoning, or what you may have heard of as alcohol poisoning in the past, um, may be to the point where we actually have to provide them some ventilatory assistance. Uh, it may cause vomiting. That vomiting can be a cho uh, choking and aspiration hazard. Um, so be aware of those kind of things. The patients may also be experiencing uh, hallucinations, what they call delirium tremens uh, or DTs. Uh, I don't see this a ton, but I have seen it in the past um, where you have an alcoholic who is having some pretty severe um, hallucinations or delirium. 
uh, that's the, the delirium tremens is characterized by um, agitation, fever, sweating, tremors. They're obviously confused, having delusions, and even potentially seizures. All right, so switch from alcohol to opioids. Opioids are a, a very common narcotic medication used to relieve pain. As you all know, the opioid crisis in, in America now has, has uh, put opioids at the forefront of, of all uh, drug overdoses. I can tell you from personal experience, I see almost nothing but opioids now. Um, even in the last, even, you know, five, ten years ago, it seemed like there were still folks who were using crack and, and methamphetamines and other things. And, <clears throat> excuse me, now it seems like, and maybe it's just because the numbers are so high, it seems like all we see is folks using opioids. Um, so incredibly addictive. Um, it is a, a, a natural and a synthetic uh, uh uh, opioids, so there are both natural and uh, lab-created opioids. Um, it's it's uh, comes from poppy seeds out of the opium uh, opium plant, um, which both codeine, morphine, oxycotton, those are all derivatives of that. So there you see some. Uh, you can look at the table there and look at some different common opioids and opiates. Obviously, you've all I'm sure heard of heroin. Heroin's uh, the natural product created uh, in a clandestine lab um, for um, uh, out of uh, excuse me out of the poppy seeds out of the, the opium plants um, ones that are created in labs uh, you know that are actually used for legitimate pain control reasons but also abused uh, fentanyl hydrocodone uh, morphine methadone oxycodone those kind of uh, uh, medications. So prescription opioid drugs are among the most commonly abused drugs in the United States. Um, that's where this opioid problem uh, began, was overuse of uh, prescription opioid pills. The government has cut back on that quite a bit by restricting the amount of opioid pills that folks can get. And so now we see a lot more folks that are just using straight up heroin or fentanyl, um, you know, illegal fentanyl. Opioids, uh, like alcohol, are, are CNS depressants, so it is a downer. Um, it, it brings everything down, including their respiratory drive, so you have severe respiratory depression. Uh, and then cardiac arrest can follow if not treated because of the respiratory depression. So the patient basically um, becomes so euphoric and so relaxed that they have no longer feel the need to breathe. Um, their, bre their respiratory rate, their breathing slows way down. Uh, and then they go into cardiac arrest due to uh, hypoxia. Um, although uh, seizures are uncommon, they can occur. We don't see seizures very often, I'll be honest with you. Most of the time, these patients appear um, sedated and unconscious. They look cyanotic, and then the classic sign is they have pinpoint pupils. So their pupils, their, the, if you look at the pupils, their pupils are so small, it's almost the tip of a pen. It's, it's incredibly, incredibly small, and this is a sign that we see in almost every opioid overdose. The patient has pinpoint pupils. Got a, sh a short video here um, of some different uh, uh, heroin overdoses. So a video of uh, like a montage of some different uh, overdoses. So you can see what a heroin overdose looks like if you have not seen something like this before. So as you see in some of in, in this picture and in some of these as you go along, um, you'll notice that it usually looks like, and this one's unfortunate, their child was in the back seat. But a lot of times with these heroin overdoses, it, it, they're in an almost normal, um, you know, normal situations in life. Uh, they're just sitting there in their car, seat belts on, 
Um, the car may be running, and they're just completely unresponsive, unconscious, uh, zoned out. They just look completely, they almost look like they just fell over and died. So if you look at this guy in the front here, you'll notice this is one. This is an overdose happening right in front of you. It looks like everything just stops with him. I'll, I'll go back and, and, and play it from the beginning. But if you watch him right here, it just looks like everything kind of stops. He just kind of completely zones out and then and then goes down. All right, so naloxone or Narcan, it's the same drug, just a uh, trade versus generic name. Naloxone or Narcan is, is a kind of an antidote. It reverses the effects of opioid or opioid overdose. So if you, um, if you think about it, the easiest way to explain this is when an opioid, um, when, you in, when, you, when you ingest or inject an opioid into your system, that chemical, the opioid chemical actually binds to receptors in the brain. And when it binds to those receptors in the brain, it tells the body to, to be very relaxed and comatose and slow down their breathing and feel euphoric. What Narcan or Naloxone does is it puts up a wall and it, and it binds to those receptors so that the opioids can't. And so it's a very effective drug, um, but it does wear off. So if the patient has taken a lot of opioids, if the patient has taken a, an excessive amount or um, or they have some sort of opioid patch on or something like that where it's a slow release medication, the naloxone will wear off um, and then that opioid can actually come back and cause them to overdose again. Um, so opio or, uh, naloxone is administered intravenously, intramuscularly, or intranasally. Right now at this time in the state of Ohio, as EMTs, it's in your scope of practice to administer naloxone intranasally. So you'll do this through a nasal spray or a MAD device, that's M-A-D, MAD device, and that stands for a mucosal atomizer device. So uh, that is a, a nasal spray that you would squirt up into their nose. It, it takes that uh, naloxone and puts it into very fine droplets and then allows those droplets to um, soak through the, the nasal passageways and, get, and, and be absorbed into the bloodstream. Um, should only be used on patients with agonal respirations or apneic. So, um, you shouldn't. You don't need to give naloxone to somebody who's breathing normally. If they're breathing normally and they're doing fine, that's that's not a true overdose of opioid. The overdose is when that patient is no longer breathing normally. Their agonal, their respiratory rate is very slow or shallow, or they're apneic. That's the patient who needs naloxone. Um, prior to administering the naloxone, if you ever see this on a test question. If you have somebody in overdose, in um, uh, opioid overdose, uh, the first thing that you want to do is bag that patient. So get the BVM out, get an airway adjunct, and start giving them respirations with the bag valve mask. And then after that is taken care of, that's when we would administer the Narcan. So Narcan or Naloxone should not be the first treatment. The first treatment should be airway, airway breathing and circulation, ABCs. All right, so moving on to sedative and hypnotic drugs, um, barbiturates or, uh, benzo or uh, benzodiazepine, uh, benzodiazepines, uh, they are um, relatively easy to, to obtain and relatively cheap. So they're, they're um, uh, some different medications that you might see are, are like seizure, ty seizure type medications. Uh, pretty easy to get these medications from doctors. They're CNS depressants, uh, much like alcohol and, and opioids, uh, central nervous system depressants. So they can alter the level of consciousness, make the patient drowsy, um, appear peaceful or intoxicated. Generally taken by mouth and in pill form. Um, so something you may see out there. Uh, they, they may be given, so another use for these that people, you know, illegal use for these is, is given as a knockout drink. So um, something like roofies uh, would be classified in, in this uh, as a sedative hypnotic drug.
All right, inhalants. So moving on to abused inhalants. Um, these agents are inhaled um, like acetone, xylene, uh, found in glues, cleaning compounds, uh, paint thinners, paints, lacquers. Um, so this would be the, the, the term huffing paint would follow, fall under this abused inhalants category. Gasoline, uh, different fuels are things that are abused. Um, commonly abused by teenagers. Don't see this as much anymore. I know this was a lot more popular in the 80s and the 90s. Um, don't see this as much anymore, but it is possible it is out there. Certainly use special care. You don't want to, um, first off, you don't want to breathe any of these things in yourself. Uh, but second off, these uh, patients, their heart becomes very, very sensitive uh, once they've once they've inhaled these chemicals. So um, keeping their level of, of anxiety or keeping their, their level of activity really, really low is important. So, so don't have them get up and walk to the cot. Don't have them get up and, and, and move around. You want to put them onto the stretcher, move them into the medic, keep them calm, keep them relaxed and transport them to the hospital. Um, hydrogen sulfide, I talked about this um, being one of the uh, chemicals that uh, folks use to commit suicide. Um, and this has been found um, for a while there. It, was, it, got, a, it got kind of popular. Uh, people that, that wanted to commit suicide would, would find a way to make this using um, uh, fertilizers and other chemicals, pesticides, things like that. Um, and then they would um, release these chemicals into their car while they were sitting in their car. And it would cause, you know, pretty pretty quick death. If you suspect this, you need to back away and wait for a hazmat team. Um, some signs and symptoms of this include nausea, vomiting, um, confusion, difficulty breathing, obviously lack of consciousness, seizure. And then they're going to go into cardiac arrest. And you could, too, if you become affected by it. That's why it's important to to back away and uh, and get, get professional help, get the hazmat team uh, on the way. So this is um, this is an actual uh, a case where someone had committed suicide in a car, and a, this was actually happening with a lot of these cases. They were actually putting notes on the the windows, on the inside of the windows of the car, um, to warn first responders. So if you were to see a note like this, hydrogen sulfide inside the vehicle, extremely toxic, call hazmat before opening. What they're just, I mean, it, it was kind of a common courtesy. Um, you know, they were. They were trying to kill themselves. They weren't trying to hurt anybody else, so they put these notes up. This actually happened quite often um, with these cases. So if you see something like this, you see a note or something like this, trust it uh, and back away and call the hazmat team. Uh, Sympathil uh, mimetics, uh, these are uh, CNS stimulants. So we've talked a lot about CNS depressants. Um, now we're kind of switching gears and talking about the stimulants or the uppers. Um, these mimic the effects of the sympathetic nervous system. Um, so you see there the list of those. And if, if you want to pause the video and take a look at that list, you're more than welcome to do so now. Uh, but a couple different notable ones on there, cocaine, crack, uh, ecstasy, MDA, meth, molly, speed. These are all uh, amphetamines, these are all uh, uh, sympathomimetics. So um, they're, they're mimicking that sympathetic fight or flight uh, nervous system, causing them to feel um, very energetic. Stimulants an agent that produces that excited state. So they're, everything's going to be up. Their blood pressure is going to be up. Their heart rate's going to be up. Their respiratory rate's going to be up. And their pupils are going to be the opposite of what we see with opioids. They're going to be dilated. So instead of having constricted pupils, pinpoint pupils, their pupils are going to be very wide and dilated. Um, so as I said before, this includes amphetamines, methamphetamines, um, those, those types of drugs. Um, cocaine certainly falls into this uh, category. Um, we see cocaine smoked, uh, injected, um, snorted, a lot of different ways for them to, uh, uh, to ingest cocaine. Acute overdose of these uh, of these uppers or stimulants is a, is genuine emergency. So they've got a high risk of seizure, cardiac dysrhythmia, stroke. Um, what you'll see typically is a, a patient who's taken some sort of stimulant and they're complaining of uh, chest pain, chest palpitations, heart palpitations. Um, so we're really concerned about their cardiac dysrhythmias. 
Um, so we're going to want to provide them, uh, you know, immediate transport to the hospital. All right, so uh, synthetic cathinones, uh, otherwise known as bath salts. I'm sure you all have heard of bath salts. Um, we don't see it as much anymore. Um, about, I would say, probably five, six, seven years ago, uh, this became quite popular. Um, bath salts, uh, obviously illicit drug. It's similar to MDMA. Um, it is a, a, a fight or flight response. It's a sympathetic nervous system stimulant. Produces euphoria, um, supposedly mental clarity and, and sexual arousal. Um, however, in larger doses, and since this is a, um, produced illegally, clandestine, um, most of the time the, the effects that they're looking for are, um, you know, even worse, you know, or, or I should say they're, they're exaggerated. Um, so these effects can last for as long as 48 hours. You see these folks uh, grinding their teeth, muscle twitching, lip smacking, confusion, um, paranoia, hallucinations. They can be incredibly violent. Um, they almost look like uh, zombies uh, that are that are you know on the war path. They're they're just uh, nothing can take them down. So I've got a video here of some of uh, bath salts example, um, and this patient um, that you're going to notice here looks a little more. Um, you know, agitated um, than, than what the slide says there for, for the normal symptoms. But it's pretty wild when you see these patients. I can, I can attest I've seen a, a handful of them, and it's pretty scary, pretty wild. Your safety is important. So if you look closely on this uh, video, you can see he's covered in blood uh, and he's getting blood all over the wall there. So he's obviously injured himself to the point where he's bleeding. Uh, they, these folks usually don't uh, feel much pain. Uh, they usually, uh, you know, just the, again, zombie like um, it's pretty wild, pretty scary to see. Protect yourself in these events. Um, certainly don't get yourself in a position where they can hurt you. All right, so you get the point with that video. Um, I know from personal experience, one patient that I had, I was a female patient that had taken bath salts, um, and she was uh, in the middle of the roadway, scraping the um, the pavement with her with her hands, and she had completely scraped all of her fingernails off, and was bleeding everywhere, just continually scraping the 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 uh, uh, the pavement with her hands. It's just incredible. Uh, really incredible uh, uh, cases here with bath salts. So be cautious, be careful, um, try to keep them calm as possible and, and get them to the hospital as quickly as possible. You may um, need ALS assistance, and I would highly recommend ALS assistance. Um, ALS in these cases are going to chemically restrain the patient, so they're going to give them a medication, a sedative to get them to basically stop uh, stop doing what they're doing. All right, marijuana. Marijuana is um, uh, it's used throughout the world. It's as you as you're well aware, it's it's becoming um, uh, legalized in, in you know um, a lot of parts of, of America. Um, produces euphoria, relaxation, drowsiness. Um, be quite honest with you, I haven't been involved with very many cases that marijuana was a medical emergency. Um, with very high doses, it's possible. Patient, especially with uh, with uh, edibles and things like that, there, there's a possibility to overdose on this. And if they do overdose, they're going to experience hallucinations, uh, anxiety, uh, paranoia. So be aware of that if they have taken a, 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 a you know an excessive amount um, of marijuana or THC through through edibles or something else. Um, keep in mind that they may have some some hallucinations, uh, some paranoia, those kind of things. Certainly, that would be a, pa a patient where transport them to the hospital. 
Um, sometimes ingestion of marijuana, so if they actually eat it, um, it can be it can lead to what they call uh, cannabinoid uh, hyperemesis. So they start vomiting and they vomit quite a bit because of it. Haven't run into any of those cases. There's a, there was a, again, it was, it was a handful of years back, there was a synthetic marijuana out called uh, K2 or Spice. Um, it was um, sold as a, an herbal incense. However, people were, were smoking it. Um, they, were, they were selling it as an incense, I believe, to, to get around the laws. Um, it, was, it was produced, um, you know, to achieve that similar high of marijuana. However, powerful and unpredictable effects were resulting from this. So people were having, you know, simple euphoria like marijuana to complete loss of consciousness to some serious medical problems. So be aware if you see anything, um, it's still out there. I have still seen it around every now and then. If you see anything called spice or K2 or synthetic marijuana, um, just be aware of the possibility of, of some very adverse symptoms. There's some pictures I found uh, on the internet of, of some, some different packaging. So this is what the typical packaging would look like. Um, of K, K2 or Spice. Um, hallucinogens. Hallucinogens alter a person's perception. So the classic example there, LSD. You can see there on the chart some different, uh, some different hallucinogens out there. So these agents are going to cause visual hallucinations, uh, intensify vision and hearing. Um, separates the the user from reality so they they go into um they experience a bad trip um they go away from reality so they're in their own essentially they're in their own world may have hypertension tachycardia anxiety paranoia keep that person calm um you don't want to um you don't want to play too much into the reality that they're in, but but you don't want to uh, you don't want to always bring them out of that reality. Sometimes it's easier just to to kind of play along and and provide a calm um, manner of emotional support and and try and, and get them to to be transported, um, you know, with the, with the least amount of excitement and and aggravation possible. All right, so we're going to talk about anticholinergics and cholinergics. Um, anticholinergics are uh, uh, medications that have properties that block the parasympathetic nervous system. So some common um, drugs that you would see are atropine, Benadryl, Benadryl in high uh, doses, um, Jimson weed, um, amitriptyline is another one. Um, I've got here uh, dry and hot put down. The patient's going to be exhibiting um, dry skin, dry mouth, dry nasal passageways, and their skin's going to be very hot. So those are your classic signs or symptoms there. So if you've got somebody who's taken um, atropine, uh, taken an excessive dose of Benadryl, um, or you've heard of uh, Jim, or you've heard of someone taking Jimson Jimson weed, um, and you see them, their skin's dry, their skin's hot, their their mouth is dry, their their nasal passages are dry. Um, that's an old, anticholinergic um, overdose. You may have heard of tricyclic antidepressants. Um, they have a significant anticholinergic effects. So if someone has taken uh, an overdose on a tricyclic antidepressant, which is a, an antidepressant medication that is prescribed to that patient, um, they will appear again dry and hot. Um, death from these agents can be rapid. So the patient will go from normal to having a seizure and then going into cardiac arrest within about 30 minutes. So if you see something that is uh, a tricyclic antidepressant or you find a drug, you find a medication, you search it, um, and it says uh, that it is an, uh, an, a tricyclic antidepressant, you want to take that uh, seriously and get that person to the hospital as soon as possible. All right, so the opposite side of that, cholinergic agents. These agents um, overstimulate the bodily functions um, that are controlled by the parasympathetic nerves. So these include nerve gases, and um, this this um, cholinergic agents, uh, where you would want to think about this is any sort of chemical warfare or organophosphate overdose. Organophosphates are pesticides, insecticides, fertilizers. Um, so if you've got the fertilizer truck that has flipped over on the highway and it's spewing gas out of out of the tank. Um, that's a that's a, a, a cholinergic emergency 
um, and that's essentially going to cause um, these things that you see here. Um, and I'll talk about, I believe, okay, yeah, there's some mnemonics here. So poisoning of these cholinergic agents are going to present with excessive salivation, mucus, runny nose, urination, diarrhea. It's, so it's the opposite of an anticholinergic. The anticholinergic makes you dry. The cholinergic makes everything wet. So it causes a massive amount of fluid to be excreted by this person. There's two mnemonics that they use here in the book. One is dumbbells. I, you don't hear of this one much. What uh, what you'll more commonly be uh, referred to as sludgem, S-L-U-D-G-E-M, and that stands for salivation or sweating, lacrimation, urination, defecation, gastric upset and cramps, emesis, which is vomiting, and muscle twitching. Uh, so those are the signs or symptoms of someone who's got uh, who's overdosed on a cholinergic agent. Um, the most important consideration is to avoid the exposure yourself. So decontamination, hazmat team is going to have to be uh, uh, consulted and in route for, for these types of runs. Um, these these uh, folks are going to need to be decontaminated. If this is the event of, um, of a terrorist type event where um, a terrorist has released a, a large amount of a, a cholinergic agent, like an organophosphate, um, some sort of some sort of uh, biological warfare. Um, there are duo dote um, auto injectors available, and these are antidote kits. It's a single auto injector containing atropine and um, uh, pralidoxime, and that those two medications are going to. If you notice, atropine is an anticholinergic. Um, so it, it reduces the effects of that cholinergic agent. These duodo auto injectors um, are found uh, through emergency services. So fire departments, EMS departments, hospitals, military, they're the ones that carry these. So for example, um, in the city of Columbus, we carry a massive amount of duo dotes um, that are for rescuers, for fire and EMS. Uh, purposes only, and we carry those on certain vehicles uh, in throughout the city. So in the event that a, a chemical warfare um, is used on the residents of, of Columbus, we've got these duodo auto injectors that are intended to be used on ourselves as first responders. So we pull these out, we give ourselves the injection, um, and then we can go on to continue helping people. That's the intent. All right, so some miscellaneous drugs, other things that you may uh, uh, come in contact with. There's a list there: um, benzocaine, calcium channel blockers. There's, you know, there's a, a, a million different medications out there that somebody can overdose on. One of the big um, things that I want you to remember or think about is if there's any suggestion that someone has ingested uh, a poison or too much of a medication. Um, but we're going to treat those essentially all the same in the fact that we're going to call uh, poison control. We're going to transport this person to the hospital. You're going to monitor their ABCs. So just go, fall back to the basics, fall back to the ABCs, transport that person to the hospital, and call poison control. Because the signs and symptoms of these many, many different drugs um, depend on that, that medication that's been ingested. So please call the poison control center as soon as possible and get that person transported. Um, aspirin's one that uh, uh, folks uh, ingest, um, and that uh, remains as a potential lethal con condition if somebody's ingested too many aspirin that may result in nausea, vomiting, uh, hyperventilation, ringing in the ears. Um, generally, you're gonna see that person with anxiety, confusion, um, tachypnea, which is fast respiratory rate, hyperthermia, high temperature, the possibility of having a seizure as well. So um, aspirin as well as uh, uh, Tylenol, acetaminophen, very common. Uh, we see this a lot with suicide attempts. Somebody will, um, and for some reason it's generally like a, like a teenage population, young adult population we see, um, takes an entire bottle of Tylenol. Uh, it, is a, it is an incredibly dangerous overdose, and the, and the, the fact is that it's, it's a terrible, terrible way to go. The, uh, the person uh, takes that, that high amount of acetaminophen or Tylenol and it causes their, their uh, liver and kidneys to shut down over a long period of time. They end up spending a long, long time in the hospital and dying a very slow, painful death. 
Um, so if you see something like that, obviously recognition, rapid transport to the hospital. Hopefully the hospital can get that pumped out of their stomach quick enough. Um, otherwise they're going to be in trouble. Um, alcohols, it, this is kind of hard to believe, but um, alcoholics, if they have a hard time finding um, drinking alcohol, alcohol that you would normally drink, like wine, beer, liquors, um, we will see these folks purchase rubbing alcohol, ethylene glycol, methyl alcohol off of the, the store shelves, pharmacy sh shelves, and drinking those kind of things um, to get intoxicated. So pretty crazy that that happens, but it does. It happens all the time. It causes some major problems, tachypnea, blindness, renal failure. Uh, eventually, they're, they're going to die um, from doing that kind of stuff, but it's usually a last uh, a last ditch effort for that alcoholic to get some sort of intoxication. All right, so food poisoning. Um, again, we've been talking about a lot of drugs and chemicals and things like that. Kind of, kind of switch gears a little bit here. Food poisoning. Um, it is still classified as poisoning, um, so we need to be concerned about it. But it's a little bit more of a medical condition um, than a poisoning issue. Uh, but it is caused by eating food contaminated by bacteria. So this is all natural. Um, the organism itself causes the disease or produces toxins that cause the disease and food poisoning causes, um, uh, there's just a list of some different, uh, bacteria um, that cause food poisoning, salmonella being one of the most common that you hear of. Um, it produces GI problems. So GI symptoms, um, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, diarrhea, basically the, the body at this point is trying to get rid of that, that bacteria. Um, proper cooking kills the bacteria, so always remember, you know, to, to cook meat to the, to the proper temperatures, and cleanliness in the kitchen prevents uh, prevents contamination of, of any uncooked, uncooked foods. On the more severe side uh, of food poisoning is a condition called botulism. You may have heard of botulism before. Um, botulism results from eating improperly canned food. So food that's been canned uh, improperly, sat for a long period of time, um, can, can cause uh, botulism. Um, it's a neurologic uh, symptom. So blurring vision, weakness, difficulty spree uh, speaking or breathing, um, it starts to affect that, uh, the neuro pathways in the brain. Again, with with uh, with food poisoning, not a huge uh, importance to try to determine the specific cause of the GI problem. Um, rather, we just need to transport them to the hospital um, and gather as much information as we can to pass along, and then certainly treat uh, the conditions that we can treat, which is primarily for us is is the ABCs, um, monitoring their airway, their breathing, uh, circulation. Those are important. Um, but other than that, really, there's not much we're going to do for folks with, with these GI problems with food poisoning other than uh, recognize and get them to the hospital safely. Plant poisoning, we'll kind of breeze through this a little bit, but there's uh, tens of thousands of, of cases of plant poisoning. Um, if in a lot of times these are either uh, someone who thought that they knew what they were doing uh, and they ingested some sort of plant in the wild um, that was toxic or poisonous, um, or it was from, um, you know, a younger, a younger child who ate a, a house plant, who ate a piece of a house plant. Um, so you'll see there, there's a whole list of, of different house plants, uh, mistletoe, you know, castor beans, um, uh, poison hemlock. There's all kinds of different things, uh, different plants out there that are toxic if ingested. So if that's possible, again, it's impossible to memorize every plant. So if, if it's possible that someone has ingested a plant, um, certainly locate the, the or excuse me, uh, uh, call the poison control center. Uh, you can describe that plant to them. Um, if, if you can't describe it or you can't give them a call, take the plant with you to the emergency department or at least take like a leaf uh, from the plant so that it can be identified and then that patient can be treated um, properly. So there's just some pictures of some different uh, different toxic plants. Uh, 
Um, irritation, um, irritation of the skin or mucous membranes is a problem with uh, a common house plant. Um, as with any other uh, irritating uh, mucous membrane, or excuse me, irritation of a mucous membrane, we want to maintain an open airway. So if, if this has been ingested, this particular plant, excuse me, <clears throat> has been ingested, we want to make sure that we are maintaining a, a patent airway. Um, if there's an irritation of those mucous membranes, there's a possibility of that person, um, swell, that airway swelling up. All right, so we'll go over some review questions here, uh, and then that'll wrap up chapter 21. All right, number one, which of the following questions is of least pertinence to the EMT for the EMT to ask a patient who is intentionally overdosed on a medication? So take a moment and look at those uh, answers. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so the correct answer here is D. Why did you take the medication? We talked about this earlier. This is in, in, in the initial questioning, uh, which is the least important. The least important is asking why. Uh, we can talk about why they took this medication later, but in the emergent setting, in the, in the immediate uh, setting here, we need to know how much do they weigh, how much do they take, uh, how much did they actually ingest, how much did they actually get in uh, into their system. Those are the important questions. Why they took the medication, that's something that we can certainly uh, d discuss or deal with at a, at a later time. Number two, a 30-year-old male who ingested an unknown substance begins to vomit. What should we do here? You should collect the vomit and bring it to the hospital, apply a bag valve mask, analyze the vomitus, and try to identify the poison, or suction his oropharynx for no longer than 30 seconds. Correct answer here is A, collect the vomitus and bring it to the hospital if possible. So if the patient vomits, uh, you can examine for pill fragments, but the reason that C is incorrect is because we're not going to actually analyze the vomit to try to identify the particular poison. That's what the, that's what the hospital is going to do. So we're going to collect that vomit, take it to the hospital with us. Ideally, if, if this patient's actively vomiting, you can have them... Um, you know, on the ambulance, you're going to have uh, emesis bags, vomit bags. You can have them uh, vomit into those emesis bags, which can be safely transported with you to the hospital. All right, number three, when caring for a patient with a surface contact poisoning, it's important to remember which of the following. Take a second to read those. The correct answer for this one for number three is B, avoid contaminating yourself and others. Remember, seeing uh, safety, your safety, um, is, is of primary concern. So B is the correct answer there. Avoid contaminating yourself or others. We're not um, prevent contamination of the patient. Uh, the patient's already been contaminated, so that's not the correct answer. As far as letting the hospital remove the surface poison, uh, we're not going to wait to the hospital to let the hospital do that. That's one of that's going to be one of our jobs or one of the hazmat team's jobs. So we're going to uh, remove that surface poison prior to getting to the hospital, and then um, immediately flush dry chemicals with water. That's incorrect because what do we do with dry chemicals? We brush them off. So we're going to brush them off, uh, not flush them with water. All right, number four, most poisonings occur via which route? Injection, ingestion, inhalation, or absorption? The correct answer here is B, ingestion. Approximately 80% of the poisonings occur by ingestion, taking it through the mouth. Number six, after taking uh, Vicodin for two years for chronic pain, a 40-year-old woman finds that her usual dosage is no longer effective and, go, and she goes to the doctor to request a higher dosage. What is that an example of? An addiction, dependence, tolerance, or drug abuse? The correct answer here is that is an example of uh, a tolerance. And she has an increased tolerance to this medication. Um, so she's not, she's not necessarily addicted to it. We can't make that assumption that just because she's requesting a higher dosage means she's addicted to it. 
Well, same same reasoning. She's not necessarily dependent upon that medication. She may be able to not take it at all. She just has a higher tolerance to it. Uh, certainly not a, not necessarily a drug abuse situation either. Number seven. Which of the following effects does drinking alcohol not produce? So, which of the following effects does drinking alcohol not produce? Take a look at those answers. And the correct answer there is D, increased sense of awareness. It actually decreases, alcohol decreases the sense of awareness. So the alcohol actually, uh, or as well, the alcohol um, induces sleep. It slows their reflexes. It causes a, uh, inappropriate behavior. So D is the correct answer. Uh, increased sense of awareness. All right, number eight, a 21-year-old male was found unconscious in the alley. Your initial assessment reveals that his respirations are slow and shallow. His pulse is slow and weak. Further assessment reveals that his pupils are bilaterally constricted. His presentation is most consistent with an overdose of what? Cocaine, opioids, stimulants, or methamphetamines? So the answer here is uh, B, an opioid. So some things to look for with opioids. Remember, an opioid is a depressant. It's going to cause things to go down. Slow, shallow respirations, and then that constricted pupils, that's the telltale sign of an opioid overdose. Everything else here, cocaine, stimulants, and methamphetamines, those are all uppers or stimulants. Those would cause increased respirations, increased pulse, uh, and dilated pupils. All right, number nine, the pneumonic sludgem can be used to recall the signs and symptoms of a cholinergic drug poisoning. The E in sludgem stands for what? And the correct answer for nine is emesis. The E in sludgem stands for emesis. And this is, again, uh, signs and symptoms of the cholinergic drug poisoning, which is typically organophosphates, uh, biological warfare, and also uh, fertilizers, pesticides, insecticides, um, other causes of cholinergic poisonings. All right, number 10, food poisoning is almost always caused by eating food that contains what? Fungi, viruses, bacteria, or protozoa? And the correct answer there is C, bacteria. So food poisoning almost always caused by eating foods that contain uh, bacteria, one of the most common being salmonella. Salmonella poisoning, uh, by far the most common food poisoning um, issue that we've got out there. Okay, that's all we've got for chapter 21. Uh, we'll see you next time.